Welcome to the Rise Above Project. I'm your host, Joe Peroni. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, champion bodybuilder, and I've been a personal trainer for about 30 years. This podcast is about helping people with their emotional, spiritual, and physical fitness. I value strength, toughness, and truth. I despise complacency, the victim mentality, and following the herd. If you find my work to be valuable, please subscribe to my channel and tell a friend. The topic for today is self-assertiveness, to be or not to be. Assertiveness training is a form of behavioral therapy designed to help individuals stand up for themselves while being respectful of themselves and others. The goal is direct, appropriate communication while maintaining a balance between passivity and aggression. You can train others to treat you the way you want. Sometimes it's necessary to separate from those who won't or can't treat you the way you want. As you can see, I have a video here, and Lola the Pug is an absolute expert in self-assertiveness. Keep in mind that she only weighs about 20 pounds She's old and she's blind, yet she has the confidence to jump on the couch and show me exactly what she wants. Food is important to Lola, and if you have it, she doesn't wait for you to share, and she doesn't steal it. She will ask, and that's the perfect balance between passivity and aggression. She also shares the house with a chow and a pit bull mix. She has no problem moving them out of the way when they get too close to her food bowl. Lola has confidence and is assertive because she has been loved, supported, and protected since the day she was born. She has been fed, walked, shown affection, and got to the vet in a consistent, reliable manner. If she were a person, you might say that all parts of her personality have been accepted, validated, and there is an understanding that she is a separate entity as opposed to being a narcissistic extension of the family. Now this is the fertile soil in which positive self-image is nurtured and the expression of self-assertiveness is allowed to grow. In terms of personal growth, my question is this, what is blocking an individual's ability to be assertive? Unfortunately, that's not a question most mental health clinicians want to answer. Most mental health clinicians, such as Jordan Peterson, tell the world what self-assertiveness is and why it's important, but they tend to dismiss the difficult work of helping people cultivate the ability to be assertive. Empirical evidence suggests that the practice of assertiveness skills improves psychological and emotional well-being. However, knowing what assertiveness is without the psychological strength or the resources to implement it is not beneficial. Therefore, my professional opinion is that assertiveness is not the primary issue. Most people know the importance of assertiveness or advocating for themselves. Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. But in this case, it's not true. That's one of the reasons why people feel so bad when they don't stand up for themselves. All children are born egotistical and they advocate for themselves. When have you ever seen a child not cry for attention when they need something? Kids are also extremely honest and they have no problem telling adults when they are not being treated fairly. It is only as these young souls mature that something or someone in their environment has eroded their boundaries and led them to believe it is a safer and more productive option to be passive or aggressive than it is to be assertive. The focus needs to be on where, when, and how the environment has corrupted their self-esteem and diminished their ability to draw boundaries between themselves and others. The advice that Peterson and others give is the biological wisdom that we are all born with. Here it is, number one, know what you want and know how you want to be treated. Number two, stand up for yourself and ask for what you want. 
Very, very simple. But let me add some commentary. The quickest way to a bad life is to believe that the world owes you something and that you have a divine right to the blues when other people fail to live up to your expectations. If you don't get what you want, then it's time to recalculate a different course. But if you want to improve your chances, don't blame others and don't try to control them. Number three, it's best to use I statements. So here's an example. I feel worried and upset when you don't call me if you're going to be late. I would prefer a phone call next time. There you go. It's assertive, not aggressive, but definitely not passive. Now that we know better, what are the chances of doing better? The chances, unfortunately, are still very limited because assertiveness training is predicated on people changing their thoughts, which denies the reality that thoughts are symptoms of deeper issues and early childhood programming. The chance of success would be greater if the underlying issues and trauma were processed. Typically, if a person has difficulty making boundaries and being assertive, it is because sometime in their childhood, they were denied the right to have boundaries and their needs were neglected. This can form two extremes. A person can build strong metaphorical walls and boundaries, which is an attempt to separate them from any emotional or physical danger. In terms of confrontation, they are more likely to show anger and aggression. A person can also decide to have no boundaries at all. And this is an attempt to never be violated by not having any walls, boundaries, or rules to violate. In terms of confrontation, they are more likely to be submissive and compliant. An individual such as this may be considered to have an agreeable personality when in fact it is a symptom of trauma. Many people have experienced complex trauma. This trauma does not have to include physical trauma. The constant unrelenting stress that can't be mitigated or distanced from due to a child's dependence on their caregiver, caregivers causes deep long-lasting wounds. When a child's environment and caregivers take away their freedom to disagree, bargain, or have an opinion, they will have a very difficult time forming a strong sense of self. Couple this with the internalization of critical judgments and faulty beliefs. A child will adapt by having a heightened ability to invalidate themselves throughout their life. Unless there is some type of epiphany or intervention. If the love, support, and approval a child receives is conditional and based on what they do or don't do, rather than being lovable just because they exist, that will prime them to have emotional flashbacks whenever a confrontation or a transgression occurs. They learn to be overly responsible for others' emotions. They become codependent and become people pleasers. In this environment, there is very little success in teaching someone to be assertive by essentially just demanding them to just do it. Self-awareness is the best start for someone on the path toward assertiveness, boundary making, and self-respect. It must start with the self. The boundary an individual needs to make is the conscious nurturing of their mind, body, and spirit against a superficial, unconscious world. This is referred to as self-care. You need to treat yourself as you're the most important person because you are. You need to eat natural foods to nourish the body, to get proper sleep, and need to participate in activities that enhance the mind. As an individual improves the way they treat themselves, the less likely they are going to spend time with people who disrespect them. Or if you are forced to spend time with people who insult your soul, such as at work or maybe with your own family, you will develop the power of inner defiance as an antidote. 
Emotional literacy needs to be part of any personal growth program. A person who has difficulty with assertiveness may have difficulty recognizing and experiencing their own feelings. As you begin to own your own feelings, it becomes easier to allow, to allow others to be responsible for their feelings, and it becomes natural to make boundaries between the self and the external world. The root problem that needs to be addressed for those with childhood trauma and those who have difficulty advocating for themselves is to find freedom from toxic shame. The individual will also have to come to terms with the reality that they were not loved properly and that being invalidated after attempting to be assertive may bring back memories of not being valued. As the individual develops self-acceptance, he or she will be less motivated to be needed, accepted, and valued by other people. Most mental health clinicians would agree that assertiveness Assertiveness skills are important, and there I would definitely concur. It is my professional opinion that having boundaries and practicing assertiveness is a prerequisite to having any chance at a respectful, mutually satisfying, reciprocal, romantic relationship. However, you must anticipate some level of retribution or punishment when dealing with society or the business world, especially in a competitive, capitalistic country where a win-win solution is not always the goal. It is prudent to formulate a risk-to-benefit analysis to determine if being assertive is beneficial for you. The more power and perceived value you have, the more assertive you can be. It is never acceptable to be verbally abused, exploited, or treated like a doormat. If it occurs, it needs to be challenged to the fullest extent. However, I have known many successful people over the years who have climbed the corporate ladder by basing their self-esteem and self-respect on their ability to play the game, roll with resistance, and be chameleon-like in the pursuit of success. Being clandestine in the pursuit of success when others directly oppose you is not degrading. It's an important, necessary, self-respecting survival skill. To paraphrase Bob Dylan, whether you're rich or poor, you're gonna have to serve somebody. Passive aggression is looked down upon in the psychology community but it is a way of life in nature. In nature, it is the most adaptable that survives, not the strongest or the one with the biggest ego. The most powerful lion kings in the Sabi Sands or the Serengeti would never run in front of a stampede of Cape Buffalo. That would be a suicide attempt. They would be patient, calculating, and attack when the chance of success was best. Sometimes they choose not to attack. This is because they are looking for the best chance of survival for themselves and their family and are not being led by their ego. If a minimum wage employee has children to support, he or she will have to think twice if they feel the need to be assertive with their boss. Consider not listening to a therapist that tells you the only way to maintain your self-respect is to confront your employer when you feel slighted. Perhaps you will have even more self-respect by being able to feed your family, not being homeless, or by making the decision to seek other employment. Maybe your self-respect is grounded in the reality that you are making a conscious decision on your terms to cope with short-term issues in order to fulfill your long-term plan. These difficult decisions can only be made by the individual on a case-by-case -case basis. No tool is perfect for every job. It has been my experience that our society has become angrier, increasingly narcissistic, 
and it is extremely easy to offend people. An assertive statement 20 years ago may be perceived as an aggressive statement by the ever-growing population that appears to be overly oppositional and touchy. I would never advocate to silence anyone's truth, but I would suggest that one practices due diligence and consider the worst case scenario and if it is still worth the penalty. Jordan Peterson advocates always being truthful. Now keep in mind, your truth, not necessarily the truth. He wants people to be truthful no matter what the punishment is because it maintains self-respect. Let's examine that for a moment. If self-respect is dependent upon the external world hearing, validating, and possibly reacting positively to your, your, to your view of life, then your self-respect is dependent on the presence and actions of others. That is not a healthy or sustainable mindset. Self-respect, by definition, cannot be gained or lost by the external world. One can also conclude that the desperate need to be critical and tell everyone what you think, including bosses and authority figures, is a manifestation of narcissism and entitlement. That's not self-respect. Psychologist Dr. Elliot Cohen points out that maybe the problem is expectations, and it begs the question, how much should an employee expect from their employer? Certainly not as much as from a family member or a lover. It may be more beneficial to improve distress tolerance skills, learn to cope with some degree of uncomfortableness, and understand that most workers have to pay their dues. Feeling slighted can be a manifestation of low self-worth. Psychologists Martin Daly and Margo Wilson estimated that 66% of all murders were the result of men feeling that they were disrespected over trivial matters and needed to save face. No one can make another person feel disrespected without their permission. Assertiveness rights include the right to be yourself, the right to express opinions and feelings, the right to express anger, the right to do things others don't approve of, and so forth. Some of these rights are not supported in the workplace. A prepared person realizes that these rights extend to them but they also extend to other people. If a person can hurt your career or family, one must proceed with caution. I am reminded of guitar player Peter Townsend from The Who. His lyrics are, Be so nice on the outside, but inside keep ambition. There's a millionaire above you, and you're under his suspicion. Now, some may call that passive aggressive. I say it's a, it's a perfect example of survival of the fittest. Thank you for listening. I'm Joe Peroni from the Rise Above Project. Please subscribe and tell a friend. Thank you.